This was recorded at 8 p.m. on the 16th of March, Central European time. It was a conversation with Gaida Hatu, who is the founder of iStrategic. Gaida Hatu guides the development and oversees the operational efficiency of iStrategic, which is a consultant and advisory firm on the Middle East and North African affairs. Gaida specializes in political risk analysis, foreign policy, political economy, geopolitics, and business strategies. Gaida also writes a weekly op-ed in Forbes Middle East. Gay, there was actually one of the first guests I had in this podcast, and in episode 23, she came on and basically explained top to bottom China's Belt and Road Initiative. In this particular podcast, however, I wanted to ask either how the Russia-Ukrainian war was affecting the MENA region, which is Middle East, North Africa. So in this podcast, you can expect to hear about why wheat insecurity is really the biggest implication that this war is having on the MENA region, but then also hear about some of the attitudes of war and this specific war from the various cultures throughout the MENA region. And then finally, an interesting sidebar, why so many rebel groups uh, seem to be uh, joining the fight, mostly joining the Russian side of the uh, conflict, but then as well, curiously enough, a bunch joining the Ukrainian side of the conflict. So there's a lot in here. We also kind of broke away from the main topic, spoke a bit about water security as well. And with no further ado, here is Gaida Hetu. Well, welcome back, Gaida Hetu. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, glad to be here. I wanted to start off uh, with a very generalized overview, just to see what you're thinking about um, all of this before we maybe look at some specifics. But what are the implications of this war in your specific region of expertise, which is MENA, Middle East, North Africa? Yeah, um, it, it seems that, well, why would uh, a region like the Middle East or North Africa, why it, would it be implicated with the repercussions, right, and the consequences of the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine and the larger Western hemisphere? Um, yeah, they, there are multiple um, consequences here. The first and foremost is food security, right? We know that there are 800 million people in the MENA region, and they are predominantly dependent on the wheat from the Black Sea. So um, you have countries like Egypt, for example, it's the largest wheat importer in the world, and it depends on more than 70% of uh, wheat uh, imports from Ukraine and Russia, right? Oh, wow. And um, Turkey, Morocco, Lebanon, they're all absolutely trying to figure out how much they have in reserve and how much they need to scramble to find substitute for the youth imports, uh, wheat imports from Russia and Ukraine. So that is absolutely, yeah, devastating with regards to food security. Um, and, and that's not all, right? So, so while looking for substitutes from the wheat exports from Ukraine and Russia, you're looking at countries that also depend on the fertilizers right, that Russia and Ukraine export, for example, Brazil. So Brazil would be one of the substitute destinations for an alternative uh, route to uh, import wheat, but Brazil also depends heavily on the fertilizer um, export imports from Ukraine and Russia. So you see the ripple effect here, right? So you're looking for substitutes and they're also affected by the Ukrainian and Russian crisis um, in, in similar ways. Um, so. Ukraine, um, the ports that are exporting wheat are, are block, blockaded or, or attacked, right? I mean, if they close the land bridge and attack from Mariupol to Odessa, now Ukraine is, complete, uh, Ukraine is completely closed off and doesn't have um, export routes uh, through the Black Sea. Uh, that would be another, you know, constraint there. Um, uh, we're looking at future harvest of wheat in Ukraine and Russia that's also there's a lot of uncertainty there as well. So not just the wheat that is ready for export now, but also the future uh, production and um, you know the whole agricultural sector there. Um, so what else? I, you know, there's a lot there. So for example, the United Nations aid programs, right? They depend on on wheat production and flour and so forth. So now those organizations who are heavily operating in Yemen, in Syria. For example, working with the refugees and the displaced people, they have to ration their what they have as far as food and wheat and, and flour and so forth. So, the ripple effects are quite wide in the region, and this is just the security part. <laughs> yeah, those seem to be the sort of measured consequences. 
Can you speculate into some further unintended consequences mm. uh, for the region as well? Okay, so there are a few there. Um, thinking about the agreement that OPEC Plus has with Russia with regards to, uh, you know, um, identifying the amount of agreed upon um, uh, production of, of oil, and that only has increased by 400,000 barrels a day, but not more. And they're not willing to um, break that agreement with Russia because it was a hard won agreement that really um, uh, stopped the, the price war that was going on in the past two years. So um, the, the GCC countries have a lot, you know, some leverage gained in, in that uh, dispute there because there is pressure on uh, the, the supply, the amount of oil that is in the market, but also, um, you know, um, there's calls from Britain and the United States to, in order to uh, increase production to lower prices. Um, that is actually moving now. The oil prices have, have been reduced to, to probably 96 from 130 um, just a few days ago. Uh, so, so they gained some leverage there. I'm, I'm assuming that they would probably want to cash it in, in, in the files that are imported to them. For example, the, the Saudis would, would want to talk about Yemen again and try to el elicit the help of the United States and Britain to try to, re to resolve that file um, and also curb the um, activities of the IRGC, IRGC in the region. So there's a lot there where the... The, the GCC countries and the, the 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 Saudi Arabia right Saudi Arabia can allocate the leverage that is uh, gained from the Western ask for increasing oil production. Um, what else? What else can I think about? I'm thinking about the Chechen fighters, right? Um, that angle. <laughs> so 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 okay. So they're mobilized, and uh, Ramazan Kadyrov, I believe, uh, is is now in Ukraine, and and all that dynamic of that religious right dynamic that is going on there. Now, though, of course, there's a lot to be said about that instantly in the short term, but in the long term, right? So, what is the leverage gained by the Chechen Islamist fighters um, post Putin? Right. And what would that affect the dynamic in Central Asia? If you are giving uh, the Chechen fighters that much uh, reach, right, in, in, in Ukraine and closer to Eastern Europe, I mean, is that something that you really want to deal with in the future, right, in post Putin, where the grip on those groups is not as strong? as during the Putin era. I mean, just thinking about those things that might have consequences in the future, right? So, and yeah. These that are that sounds really interesting. I admit I am completely, completely ignorant to the Chechen fighters. So perhaps you could <laughs> explain uh, further. It sounds like there's some sort of maybe Islamist group. And then yeah. you're suggesting that if they're given all these sort of arms and free reign, once this all settles down, what who's their next target going to be? Is that sort of what you're thinking about? It's not just the next target, but now now you're creating leverage where where it wasn't there before, right? Um, instead of just the the containment of having Chechnya as a Russian republic under the Russian authority, now you're giving them um, linkages and and presence and 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 you know. Um, leverage in, in another country who knows what what the consequences of that that is there's a lot of uncertainty created just by allowing them reach into into ukraine and, and further eastern europe I, that is that is quite quite interesting um i don't Can know you explain who they are so they are um so the kadyrov group um, um is the one that was uh, anti russia anti um, the Soviet Union. They fought the Russia, the Chechen wars, and and uh, Putin uh, in, the, in in his earlier uh, missions that he took on was to fight against the Chechens, and he won that war. Russia won that war, and then they 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 co-opted right. So so Putin co-opted the Russian leader. Uh, he became. Um, 
very very friendly with the with the Russian uh, leadership, um, conforming to the uh, foreign policy directions that uh, the Russian leadership and, and Putin uh, have been devising for Russia and the worldview outlook. So so there's a lot of buy in by the Chechen leadership now with the Russian outlook and what the the mission here is in Ukraine, and they are fully on board with that. Um, so, but but uh, there's no hiding the fact that these are uh, have Islamic background, right? And uh, the the <laughs> the thought here is that there's a Islamic justification to fighting with the Russians against the uh, you know the other side that is seen as more heretic, is seen as as more um, you know not abiding by the. Uh, right rules, I guess. So um, the, the cooptation has worked well for President Putin, um, and they seem to be a, a, a kind of a supportive role there in Ukraine. But what comes after, right? So so what are the consequences of that? And that is something to be, you know, to be, um, I guess, um, looked at and, and uh, closely followed, especially for the people who are interested in Central Asia and, you know, the whole um, dynamic that is going to, you know, unfold there. And back to the uh, oil unintended consequences that you were speculating to earlier, you mentioned GCC. What is the GCC? Uh, so the Gulf, uh, uh, th- this is a community of countries, the Gulf countries. Um, so you have Kuwait, uh, you have uh, Qatar, the Emirates, um, uh, Oman and Saudi Arabia who have uh, established a, uh, a community of uh, a co- coalition of nations that has worked closely together for in matters of econo- e- economics and security. And, and these countries are... Um, Basically, the central parts of, of OPEC, OPEC, which is a um, uh, an, an intergovernmental organization that was uh, originated by uh, the original um, uh, five members um, uh, in Baghdad, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, KSA, and Venezuela, and. Um, and they were founded in 1960. Now they have 13 members, but with the OPEC Plus, um, additional members have been added to are, are cooperating with OPEC, the original OPEC. Uh, and the OPEC Plus now includes Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Brunei, Kazakhstan, uh, Malaysia, Mexico, Oman, um, Sudan, South Sudan, and Russia. Okay. So, um, so, so the Everyone Russia with here, oil's getting on board. Yeah, absolutely. And they had to because the 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 price wars that have uh, developed uh, because of the you know the COVID and the lack of the destruction, the demand destruction that happened during COVID, and there was a price war. Everybody was was trying to squeeze the others out of the market, and while the Saudis ha- can really produce an, a barrel of oil for. Th- for three dollars and still be okay with that price the others can't so um and the, of course the shale oil came into and into focus and the price uh, plummeted to the 40s and 30s uh, remember those days in, in 19 uh, 20, 19 and uh, 2020 so the basically the two warring sides russia and opec sat together and said well, we can do better, right? And we can manage the amount uh, supplied of oil supplied to the market where we can also be beneficial for our bottom line with regards to pricing. And this is a very hard won agreement, which is now the OPEC plus. And I don't think the Saudis would be, um, you know, you can't really entice them to try to break that um, agreement with the Russian because it would not only upset the Russians and they have interests with the Russians, but also um, it would, you know, bring their word or their, you know, commitment in, into question in the future. And that is not something a price they're willing to pay as of, as of now, of course. Okay. Let, let's return to the initial um, implication of the war for the MENA region. And that is the giant uh, fragility that they have to the supply of wheat. So you said Egypt, a population of 80 million people, 70% of their wheat comes from the Ukraine. What's, uh, what, are these, what are these countries doing now? Presumably... Um, Egypt is not alone in this uh, sinking ship. It seems like no, they all not. sort of need some weight. So what's so, happening? So 102 million population now, Egypt from maybe from the last we spoke, but, <laughs> but it, it grew, it grew a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
And and same thing with with Turkey, who is not only a export exporter importer of wheat, but also exporter of flour for to the region. So there's a, the supply chain linkages there. Um, for example, what what are the immediate policies that Egypt is? So they are putting uh, they are preventing certain foodstuffs to be exported. The same thing happened to uh, Lebanon, to to Syria. They're they're just putting um, prohibiting certain foodstuffs to be exported, right? They're worried about their food security, um, uh, rationing, right? Um, now another policy aspect that has been into consideration and has been implement, implemented in some countries is is the return of subsidies. So remember in 2011, when the whole uprising started, there was a food insecurity aspect of it because there was inflation at that time and, and the, the price of bread skyrocketed, the price of foodstuffs, basic foodstuffs rocketed. That was combined with the, the reduction of subsidies in 2011. So it was a perfect storm, right? Reduction of subsidies and foodstuffs and inflation just made people go to the streets, basically. Now you have the same combination going on with 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 the wheat, right? With the with the you know manufactured crisis in in, in Ukraine and 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 the whole uh, war that is going on there that is you know made the wheat price not only it was already thirty percent above average a year ago now it's another fifty percent. Yeah, the so, artificial reduction in supply drew the price up already, in addition to a lack exactly. of exactly. So that was an, and and they have and and they are worried about if they also put a pressure on reducing subsidies that would create the same perfect storm as in 2011 and would push people through the streets. So of course the Egyptians and the Syrians, also considering the detrimental circumstances that they are in, in addition to the Lebanese, they are returning to providing subsidies on basic foodstuffs because they have to. There's no other way because the alternative is extremely dangerous. Lebanon, for example, just accepted 250 tons of cooking oil from Russia. Uh, you would definitely know, think that Russia and China do not want unrest in the region that they have just invested in. Right, China with their investment in infrastructure with the uh, IRB, um, Russia with their investment in Syria and Lebanon and so forth, and they have um, leadership there in Lebanon and Syria where they are pro-Russia, right? And they don't want anything to to happen to that leadership at Hezbollah and so forth. So they want to support the leadership to at least provide the basic foodstuffs and aid in order for no unrest to happen so it's it's quite interesting that russia is really worried about the hard-won gains in syria uh, in iran in lebanon for example is that that could falter because of the war yeah they it seems like we obviously don't know and we we will only know with weeks and months of hindsight uh, sure. to help us but it seems like they have grossly miscalculated all of the downside that they were going to receive from this action but um so the irb in china that's the belt and road initiative uh what what is russia's investments in the region what, what have they been well uh it's it's mostly um defense agreements uh, with some countries there is the 400 s uh, s 400 with turkey right i mean there are certain inroads where russia was able to um you know create defense agreements uh for example uh, defense exports to uh, egypt has increased in the past few years so um, Russia definitely has a market there for defense, but it has a, a market there for wheat, fertilizers, and so forth. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, cooperation with regards to petrochemicals. So there, there is there is a market there, right? But uh, of course, the Chinese uh, Trump, uh, the, the the trade volume that Russia has, for example, China has with the GCC countries, the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf countries um, uh, trade uh, in the amount of, of 160 billion dollars. That dwarfs um, any trade volume that Russia has. So, so Russia, Russia and China are both heavily invested in in that region. And and you have just to imagine how much uh, there's security worries with regards to, you know, the the possibility of unrest, the possibility of of instability there. Um, and they are both very. Um, very interested in, in maintaining stability in this region. Is there anything special about Egypt's um, 
fragile reliance on Ukraine's wheat, or is this a story that is actually much bigger? Uh, well, no, sorry, not much bigger, but one which many, many countries are actually going through. Or is Egypt and the MENA region specifically fragile? So I, I would say yes to both. It is a general story in the region because of the the drought, climate change. I mean, they have been suffering a lot with, with water scarcity. But I think, I believe Egypt is, is on a much more strain, strenu strenuous situation uh, because it, it cannot, as of yet, agree with Ethiopia on, on a higher uh, allocation of water volume, especially now that Ethiopia is uh, attend, attempting to uh, refill the, the dam, the GRD uh, dam again. Um, so, so the substitutes in order not to ask for um, higher volumes of water, what Egypt resorted to is exactly that, is to import virtual water. So instead of putting actual volumes of water into the Egyptian ag agriculture, right? And, and producing the wheat on Egyptian land, they resorted to importing virtual water where other, you know, uh, soil in other countries, they are using their water and they're just importing the final product, which, with their, which they need eventually. So what would be then the alternative for Egypt if it cannot um, produce that amount of wheat on their own soil because of lack of water? right? One of the solutions they <laughs> went to is importing wheat. And now that is in question, right? So I think Egypt is really in a, in a very frantic mode right now to only, not only find the substitute of where to import wheat from other countries. I mean, of course, there are other options there. There is Pakistan, there's Ethiopia, there's Sudan. But but none of that, the volume that Ukraine and Russia was able to provide them. And, and that would be, a, a, frankly, a very, uh, very tight corner there that Egypt has to resolve because the option of being self-sufficient in wheat production is not an option for Egypt. Just because of the water scarcity that it's already going through, it's below 500 um, uh, cubic meters per person. I mean, that is, that is um, uh, severe uh, water, water stress. Yes. So, and, and if they are not going to resolve that with Ethiopia, it's even, even uh, personal use now, it, it's very, very much stressed. Um, this, you know, this is, this might be unfair of me. So I have no expectations that you know this off the top of your head, but Australia is famously um, a water restricted country. I remember growing up all the time, we had water restrictions, limits on how long you could shower. You couldn't wash your car in public and stuff. I wonder if you know what our... It, well, what is, do you know what our per person water allocation is? You just said it's 500 cubic meters for an Egyptian. So, 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 so there are different, it's called the Falcon Mark Index, uh, Ryan. So you have uh, 1,700 uh, cubic meters per person. That is your approaching water stress, right? Now, below 1,000 cubic meter per person, that is water scarcity. I mean, that is when... <laughs> and Egypt's got half of that. <laughs> that yeah, absolutely. And, and, and yeah. Egypt is, 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 is the 500, right? It's, it's where the water stress, where you it's absolutely an emergency. Uh, and there's... Also withdrawing, well, for example, you say, oh, I can still see the Nile River in Egypt. Why don't they uh, <laughs> increase, uh, for example, um, water from, from the Nile? All the rivers, all the riparian states understand that there's a certain percentage that you can withdraw from rivers. And after that, the river is not usable anymore, right? There is water there, but it's not replenishable water anymore. So there's a certain, I believe it's at 40%, and you can't exceed that. Uh, the river becomes unusable. You can't use that water anymore. So, and 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 Egypt had uh, has a history of depleting its aquifers, and there's a whole history there, right? I think one of the destination to understand, of course, is Australia and what they did, right? But also Israel, which is close by for Egypt, and they the technology, the desalination um, plants that they have. I mean, all of that a technological know-how of how to um, manage water, not just from the supply side, but also from the demand side, right, is absolutely phenomenal in Israel. And, and Egypt is, 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 is closer to that, where they absolutely have to deal with that, other than just banking on Ethiopia being more generous. Um, 
I don't want to take this too far away from the topic of war and Russia yeah, Ukraine. Ryan, it's on Ukraine, right? <laughs> yeah, but there was um in Tim Marshall's book Power of Geography, he speaks directly about that um dam, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the most unnecessary third word and a title ever, and just how it's the most tangible example of a country having a geographical power over another because it's you know they call ethiopia the sort of tabletop of 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 africa it's where most of the major rivers are birthed and the nile it comes from there and so ethiopia can just sort of turn on and off the tap as they want i mean imagine that as a stressful sort of geopolitical fragility to have if you were one of the guys in power in, in egypt and you had to deal with that so, so there's a there's a very very like historical dilemma there because across history, Ryan, as you know, these civilizations were downstream countries. Like think of Mesopotamia, think of Egypt, right? These are downstream countries. But now that leverage has flipped on its head, where the leverage is now with the upstream countries. Think of Turkey with Iraq, Syria. Think of Ethiopia, Egypt, right? It it really China and India as well. They're taking oh, the water from yeah. the Himalayas. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So, so the the idea here is 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 that not just Ethiopia has leverage; it's also the funders who have uh, you know funded the building of the dam, and that is primarily China. So China also has a leverage here, right? So it's it's quite interesting how the geopolitical in, in infrastructure in particular, and and the Chinese are are masters at that. Is that they leverage geopolitical uh, power through infrastructure, and they found in Ethiopian Dam a very much justified infrastructure because it it's very much underdeveloped. They have suffered from civil war until the 1990s, right? And and it's absolutely justified that they need economic uh, development and the dam, you know, provides electricity um, and, and other types of, of uh, economic development tools. And and yeah, that that is a great opportunity there, right? And But the thing is that I think is also balanced this out is that China also has a lot of interest in Egypt. So if anybody has probably, you know, a, a legitimate role to play as mediator, it might be the Chinese or, or of course, the World Bank, which has a lot of um, uh, experience in mediating between riparian states. But yeah, the, it's, it's not just Ethiopia. I mean, also the funders of the, of the uh, uh, great uh, Renaissance Dam have leverage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also, that was a great point you made there, just how, um, how significant a leverage... Uh, funding a foreign piece of infrastructure can be famously it's like the debt trap yeah. diplomacy um, yeah. line of things and um, I would urge if anyone was interested in that that's exactly what we spoke about in our last podcast uh, specifically yeah. the <laughs> Belt and Road Initiative and I think yeah. Sri Lanka and Pakistan specifically but yeah. back to the um, topic on hand this might seem like a silly question mm. but why is wheat so important um mm. Is there not? Is it simply just because there's no substitute good at such a low price per kilo? I mean, is it is it absolutely necessary that we can't do we can't get around the sort of efficiency of calories in for price mm. that bread is, for example? Mm. That that is where culture uh, plays a big role, right? It, it, it's the role of bread, right? And breaking bread. And, and the, the, all those phenomena around bread is, is very much entrenched in, in Arab culture. Uh, you can't, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can't escape that food stable, right? It, it's there in your face all the time in different forms. Um, and of course, the French had to come in with the croissants and all of that. So it, it's just meshed up with everything that a, a decent lifestyle, even at the at the middle income and low income level, is just part of it, right? Um, I think there are two reasons of why th this did not budge, although the leaders in those countries knew that this is a weak spot and they cannot, for the life of them, be self-sufficient in production of wheat. Saudi Arabia tried it in the 1980s and they depleted their aquifers, right? when they had to stop, right? They couldn't be the first wheat producer. It can't be done in the region to be a wheat producer. Sudan might have 
if, if everything goes back to, to stability, Sudan, Sudan might have a chance in being, you know, just covering some of the, of the, of the percentage there. But other than that, nobody can have self-sufficiency in wheat production. So, so the alternatives could not be introduced because remember all those leaders, they strived for stability, right? Regime survival. And how can you, um, you know, maintain stability if you're touching upon the main foodstuffs of the poor, rich, and, and, and the, the middle class? You won't do that. Jordan tried to even reduce a little bit of the subsidies on bread in particular, and there was the bread riot in Jordan, right? So it's really one of those, I think, the most risky um, uh, angles for any policy to have reform in. And that's why it, it has been postponed year after year. And the, the thing that makes people, you know, uh, at least not have an incentive to go out and riot is that they have the bread for the day. They, they, they know that they can feed their families. But once they know that you can't feed their families, as happened in 2011 in Syria and in, in Tunisia and Egypt, that's you basically allowing people to, to believe that they have nothing to lose if their own livelihood and survival of their families is on the line, right? So that is the, the most trickiest um, and riskiest uh, issues to tackle in the region. They ha can't have self-sufficiency in wheat. At the same time, they can't tackle uh, the subsidy that much. I, I, I do understand the, the cultural angle and mm. how it's almost unthinkable to just go without having flour in your diet and you know even in a even in Stockholm right it's just there are some diets that where you can uh, volunteer to leave them behind but I you said there um, at the end as well they at least know they have bread to feed their family is yeah. it is it is it the case that there is no substitute to bread is it the case that you remove bread from the supermarkets and all of a sudden you can't feed your family no theoretically no of course right because at least you have other carbohydrate sources you have rice and you have potatoes right mm. i mean i remember from just living in, in in germany for a while and going back and visiting syria and, and saying them you know we, we ate kartoffeln you know the 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 potatoes, right? You have potatoes next to your steak. You have potatoes next to your uh, fish, for example. So, uh, and it was so strange to hear that they they couldn't believe it. Like, how could you substitute with potatoes? So, rice is a close substitute, but it can never replace the actual, you know, uh, bread. As as a, it, it, I can't see it happening unless you actually start out with kindergarten, with school, right? This is a generational education effort where you introduce that in lunches, right? In schools and you just ingrain it in children that this is okay to do. And this is because bread is, is, is difficult to, to, I don't know, to, to grow in our countries. We can, we can now rely more on, on, potatoes and such. I mean, it's definitely a generational educational, uh, what do you call it, engineering, social engineering type of project that will, will take years. But yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, scary things that, um, you know, those leaders have to think about and tackle. To move on from the wheat question, because I think uh, you've really covered that top to bottom. That sounds <laughs> like it's the biggest sort of implication and, and downside to the region from the war. Um, but can I ask you about something else, which is uh, a little bit more niche? It, it doesn't affect the broader populations. But I've seen rebel groups from Syria and the Central mm -hmm. African Republic and uh, potentially others as well that are very motivated to join the Russian cause and denazify Ukraine. So oh, yeah. could you explain this to me in the audience? W w where does the motivation come from from these groups? Uh, so you have Russian military presence in Syria th since 2000, uh, 2015, uh, where the Russian military has really helped the Syrian government to repel uh, the, the, the and, and you know try to um, uh, nullify the the rebellion threat against the government. There are still almost over thirty percent of the Syrian territory that is still in in outside of the control of the government, but for for the most part, this Russian military has 
was able to stabilize the situation in Syria. Now, for that particular reason, you have now uh, trained armed men that have been in, in, in uh, uh, urban combat, uh, have accumulated urban combat uh, experiences, and now those can be mobilized to join the Syrian effort uh, on the Russian side. Uh, but, but to also make this interesting, uh, Ukraine also is also uh, having people who are Syrians and, and Libyans and others that are more than happy to fight the Russians in Ukraine. So you have uh, mercenaries, right, on both sides that are jo joining the, 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 you know, the whatever, the, the what's going on in Ukraine. And, you know, the idea of inviting foreign fighters, I mean, that is a double edged source because you could, <laughs> you get, you get in a, in an unstable situation, all sorts of characters right you can get the one that says well I'm, I'm here to fight the russians and then then you can find him in hungary or, or some other place right i mean so so all of that creates more uncertainty for ukraine is that it, it, it opened up the space to invite foreign fighters they are not just joining the fight with the russians against the ukraine you have also from the region people who are uh, they have been bombed by the russians right they can't wait to fight the russians uh, in another places so um, it, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, it's uh, yes, there are definitely mercenaries from Syria, from Libya and from other countries that are, are joining the fight, but not just on, on the Russian side. So, so the motivation on one hand is people want to get revenge against the Russians. So they're going to fight alongside the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Is the motivation on the other hand that they are, you know, paid mercenaries and this is a job opportunity for them? Or are there also ideological groups that want to fight alongside the Russians from the Meta region? Uh, I can tell you from the people that are going from Syria, for example, they are ideologically motivated. For So so the, 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 the Russian alliance with the Syria is, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, the, the, the Syrian military has been uh, trained and, and, and equipped and supported by, by the USSR and then later Russia for many decades. So there is an ide ideological affinity with the Russian worldview perspective. Right. There is a belief that uh, the the Russian the, the, the Russian protection of the uh, Orthodox uh, Eastern Church that is very much believed in Syria. Right. So so you also have that religious angle where uh, the Russia says we are your protectors. Right. We are the protectors, the legitimate protectors of the Eastern Orthodox Church. We are the protectors of the East, the rise of the East, right? I mean, the, the whole whole perspective there is that now a, a, a young Syrian man that is absolutely, you know, believe believe with that ideology finds that a good paying opportunity to to uh, uh, to fight with the Russians. Uh, he feels that this is a, not just an opportunity, but also an honor to do that, right? to be selected, to be trained, and to be shipped over overseas. And that's quite unfortunate because now you have a population of uh, young men who have not only experienced the horrors of war in Syria, but now have to double down on, on, on another set of horrors and, and trauma that they're going to come back with from, from Ukraine. It's absolutely devastating. Yeah, it is devastating. And, and for me, like so um, inexplicable, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I kind of begin to understand the, the, the motivations to go and um, say, yeah, defend in a region that is completely separate to you. You know, no one's going to look yeah. like you when you go over there and um, things are going to be different. Russian. Then they're yes, going to be speaking absolutely. Ukrainian and Russian to each other. You know, it, it is. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's very, absolutely. it's perplexing. Can, can you put some names to these groups um, who are heading over there? Uh, there are it's it's now the group of individuals that uh, the Russian officers on the ground in Syria and Hamimi base uh, in on the on the Mediterranean. You know that the Hamimi base is the uh, Russian base uh, in Syria uh, near Tartus, and um, yeah, it's it's where they are trained, where they are also vetted and selected. Correct. So it's not just a group. It's it's the the could be from the Syrian military, could be from the paramilitary that supported the uh, mil uh, Syrian military operations in Syria. Could be so the group of individuals that are just trained and and, and shipped. Uh, the other side is doing that as well. If you know we if there's an opening for a pro Ukrainian foreign fighter to have a place in Ukraine and fight the Russians over there. So some there's some movement from Syria on that side as well. You know what makes this absolutely um, difficult to comprehend is that 
well, you have the Russians and the Ukraine, there's, there's kinship, right? They're not only understand each other, there's also family ties between the two, right? They, it, it's the, the folk, right? They understand each other. And to have those foreign elements come in, it's, it's diluting this whole possibility of reconciliation that existed. And now you have more trauma and more possible human, uh, human, vi human rights violations. Yeah, it's, it's just clouding the picture more and more when you have foreign fighters coming into the picture. Yeah. One more on the foreign fighters, um, a group that has been infamous for you know the longest time, um, but are getting a lot of attention now since this war started out, was the what, the Wagner Group, um, <laughs> who uh, my girlfriend was telling me the other day, so I'm prepared to be wrong if this is, I didn't fact check it, but <laughs> she said Wagner, the reason it was called the Wagner Group is because um, Wagner is the famous composer and he was famously Hitler's famous composer. Mm. And the guy who founded the Wagner Group um, loved Hitler. And so he uh, named it the Wagner group after that. I, I don't know if that's true, but at least that was what, what she told me. And um, anyway, it's like an interesting backstory. The Wagner group are just dripping in atrocities uh, uh, you know, throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East as well, I'm presuming. So, and Mali, the latest. And, and Mali. And, and they're now in Mali. Yeah. So mm -hmm. could you talk about... Uh, just as as much as you've seen or or you know um what their role is in this conflict as well um so i don't know in particular in ukraine where the wagner group uh, is is positioned or or utilized and so forth i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if they are uh but i i definitely know that they had uh, their operations in in libya for example in support of haftar which you know libya is now a two section the the eastern section under haftar who is pro russia pro uae and so forth and then you have the eastern part which is supported by the united nations and the international community and so so they they had a big role to play in in libya for example they have they are now just signed a contract with the malian government who have tried to kick out the french uh, uh counter-terrorism operation in mali uh, and uh and, and now the contract is signed with the Malian government to support their security operations in Mali. So it, it's quite fascinating, the reach there. Of course, the Russian authorities deny that they are, they're, it's a private military uh, group and so forth. But yet, I, I don't know the specifics of how they operate in Ukraine, but their presence in, in, in Syria and in Libya, it's, it's, you know, everybody knows about those. Mm. Interesting. Look, I did, again, the time has absolutely flown by. Um, I feel like we got the big one sort of out of the way, which was the implication of wheat shortages for the MENA region uh, due to this conflict. I also wanted to ask you how much it was um, the people in the MENA region are paying attention to this conflict as well. Mm. Is this sort of happening in the background or are they just getting on with their lives and, hey, you know, this is absolutely nothing to do with us. We've been going through loads of stuff in the last 20 years. We'd need to worry about them. Yeah. So the people, a good percentage of the intelligentsia in the region, you know, the academics, the, the reporters, the, the, the officials and so forth who are engaged in these types of, of uh, discourses, um, a good percentage of them, they found vindication when they were trying to accuse the West of, of weak leadership. For example, Biden is weak, uh, Boris Johnson is weak. It's it's the EU is a mess, right? They, so the, all of that now there's vindication because Putin did not care and he invaded anyway, right? And 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 there's nothing from that perspective. Look. There's nothing the West can do about it other than blabber about how much they are upset. NATO cannot motivate there because they don't want to engage in, in direct combat, uh, combat with, with the Russians. So there's, there, there seems to be a sense of vindication for that percentage of in, the intelligentsia and regional threat. Like, look, we told you the, the future is in the East, right, with China and Russia because precisely of exactly what, what is going on in Russia. That's just a vindication of that. The others are 
other percentage is, is a, but, a bit more cautious, right? They said it's quite um, premature to announce the, the, the decline of the West, that they, they are, you know, useless or, or we, shouldn't take, we shouldn't care about their uh, allegiance or their friendship and so forth. So I, and I think that is a bit more prudent because there's a lot there that the United States still has, um, you know, its influence in, in, in the region. Yes, we talk a lot about the, the, the you know, the uh, disengagement of the United States from MENA, but yeah, there's a lot there. There's defense contracts, there's security agreements, there's, um, there's a lot there that the United States still has leverage in. So, um, but yeah, the, the tone overall is that, see, we told you, there's, they, they are weak, there's nothing they can do about it. And um, yeah, and, and they, a good percentage of them also justify that what Putin did, you know, for example, if someone said, oh, this is, this is the intervention in, uh, you know, in a, in a sovereign nation, for example, the, the rebuttal would be, you don't understand the Ukrainian history, right? You don't know where Ukraine belonged to first. So, so there's actually, they've read, right? And they are ready with the rebuttal and, um, uh, and they don't mind even justifying Putin's perspective here. And that is quite scary, right? Especially when you hear it from, uh, you know, educated people from countries that are traditionally pro-US. So if you hear it from a Syrian, from an Algerian, yeah, that's that's not a surprise. But if you hear it from uh, Gulf countries, right, that's that's quite an impression if that how much the perspective has shifted to engaging with the East, justifying the East, right, and just being on board with this. Mm. What, what do you Either chalk that down to? that traditionally sort of pro-US countries in the MENA region who aren't watching Russia today, you know, who aren't being fed the propaganda machine, why they still might come down on that side of this uh, conflict? I think it has a lot to do with US policy in the region post-2012 onwards, right? So the, the Arab Spring happened in 2012, uh, and here you have to remember, Arabs have long memories. They do not forget. <laughs> they hold <laughs> everything, <a grudge>. is connected. <laughs> everything is connected to everything. Right? This is the, 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 the really the Bedouin, Bedouin spirit here is that the long memory and everything absolutely has to be vindicated and, and accounted for. And they, they will never forget the, 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 <laughs> the how America has stabbed the traditional alliances with Hosni Mubarak, with the Zain al-Abidin bin Ali in Tunisia, right? And it just sided with the people on the streets. Of course, from the US perspective, that makes sense because you, how long can you support dictatorship and, and authoritarian leaders? But for the traditional leaders in the, the MENA region, it's like, this is a stab in the back and, and US cannot be trusted anymore. Now, couple that with how the United States now started to negotiate with Iran and just putting everybody else under the bus, right? And now Iran is the is the future for the region, right? Into between 2012 and 2015, that was the case for GCPOA. And um, they're willing to make an agreement with Iran, appease Iran, and that, that whole perspective now uh, accumulated in the psyche there is that we can see clearly that the United States has abandoned us. Remember a few years ago when there were um, Houthi uh, drone strikes on the major oil fields in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, Abqaiq and the others? That was a major attack where the United States did not mobilize the Patriot uh, missile defenses, right? So there was not any type of um, tangible action that would answer to that security agreement w between U.S. and Saudi Arabia is that U.S. did, did nothing, right? And again, the U.S. did nothing when uh, a major port in UAE also was attacked by the Houthis that were seen as an arm to Iran. So the stabbing of the back of traditional leaders in, in MENA, the willingness of the U.S. to do that, coupled with Iran is, is the one we're going to talk to and compromise with, yeah, that's okay. what do you want us to do? <laughs> it's, and, it's, and, and also add to that, Ryan, is that the market, the oil market is shifting to Asia, right? Most of the oil production and exports is geared to the Asian market. So it's not, oh, we're going to, for the men are Asian, exactly. 40% of a, a Chinese imports are from the GCC countries. There is a nuanced, very intricate, 
security and, and oil relations that is going to develop between the two. It's just natural. That's where the oil has a future market. You know that the EU wants to divest away from oil, right? We don't want to do anything with oil and gas. This is this is done. The US has the same. We're going to run off windmills. Exactly, exactly. As if as if they don't understand. So there are two things here. They don't understand that even the production of electric vehicles will need more petrochemical products. Where does that come, come from? From oil, right? It needs 30% more petrochemical products to make the vehicle lighter, right? To make it a fuel, uh, to make oh, it cool. uh, energy efficient. Um, the other thing is that all the wind turbines and all that, where is that coming from? This is from petrochemical products. <laughs> That is coming from oil. The worst thing one of the Saudi officials used to say, the worst thing you can do with oil is burn it for energy. There are better better, better uh, utilities for petrochemicals. Oh, that's a great line. Yeah. The other thing is here is that even with the most conservative that have accounted for uh, green energy, for uh, advancement in technology, in 2050, we're going to need 110 billion barrels a day. Now, in, in 2020, <clears throat> 2022, we use 100 million barrels a day, right? Did you the say world. 110 billion? 110. Now, now so we they're projecting a 10x increase in the next 30 years. So, so, so the thing is that now, now 100 million, 100 million, 110 million, right? Okay, okay 100 yes. Million now, yes. 100 million now, 110 million in 2050. Now, we have the sources for 100 million uh, barrels per day now. In 2050, there's an additional 10 million barrels. Where is that coming from? If there's no invest investment now and people are reducing their capex, right? Where is that 10 million, 10 million coming from? And this is accounting for green energy, accounting for. But with population growth, right, between 2022 and 2050, you're going to need 110 million barrels a day and this we're not accounting for the 10 million because everybody does want to does not want to invest in oil production oil discoveries oil drilling because of you know the many pressures from not just the federal government but also general um, you know trying to divest away from oil but there's an oil crunch that's going to develop regardless uh, in the future if there's no capex there's no capital expenditure there in this field mm. And when you say there's no capex, you mean people aren't spending loads of money to try and find new oil fields or to right. invest in better oil drilling technology. Basically, money's just not going towards it. It's being exactly uh, windmills, um, solar energy, which which I absolutely understand and absolutely am on board with. But accounting for population growth and accounting for even a percentage shifting towards electric vehicles, you still have an increase in demand for oil in 2050, no matter how you look at it, right? The, 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 the reduction in demand might be by 2050, 2 million barrels. At, at, that's a conservative estimate, but you have still, you're still a, a large amount of demand that is going to be there regardless. Just think about the petrochemicals that are going to go do go in into the production of what you need for green energy. Right? Forget about burning gas for energy. We need that same oil production to be diverted for petrochemicals to produce the materials. Plastic, right, absolutely, yeah. plastics and other all other types of of. Uh, of production that goes into turbines and, and um, uh, car frames and so forth. Do you know some crazy I learned about oil the other day? Mm. That it polyester, like the running tights, the sort of um, swimming t-shirts, is just oil spun around at some ridiculous speed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that I mean, blew my for, mind. Absolutely. The, the most um, uh, one of the the best fertilizers is is from is from oil uh, and, and because it produces nitrogen. Right. I mean, there there is a, a nitrogen nitrogen based fertilizers is, is part of that production line that can come out of petrochemical. Mm. I mean, it's it's just a vast amount of, of um, investment opportunities that is associated with oil. But now it has like a black mark on its back, right? Because it's associated with the, with the oil industry. But, yeah. you know, you don't have to divert oil for energy consumption. You can, you can basically use it to produce petrochemical products. 
Um, well, look, guy, that we've definitely uh, ventured away from the central um, <laughs> topic. So I just want to return to that for the final question. Uh, you, um, I think, yeah, covered top to bottom the role of wheat as the most obvious implication for the men region of this war. We touched on maybe a little bit of the ideological uh, reaction as well from what people are thinking to what as well rebel groups might be uh, motivated to do. Could you just look forward into the future? I don't want you to, say, make a prediction or anything, but if you could just speculate as to how the MENA region is going to be further affected by this uh, conflict. Um, Long-term well, picture. Well, um, so there seems to be a, a kind of a early consensus that the partition of Ukraine might not be reversible with the Republic of Donetsk and like, Crimea and, and the other, uh, I think, two other little republics there. And... It, it's kind of hard to see how Putin, if everything stays the same, you know, um, uh, uh, if everything stays the same, that that will change. So there's a conservative conservative scenario that says that, well, the Ukrainian partition is not something we could, you know. But now the worst scenario is that he takes over Kiev uh, and, and uh, controls Russia does forced regime change and he has a, a, a um, favorable government structure in Ukraine and it becomes uh, something uh, resembling, I don't know, maybe Chechnya or something. I mean, this is the kind of the worst scenario that hopefully it's not going to, but now the other part is, is Moldova safe, right? Are other region, are other countries in Eastern Europe safe? And will Poland, for example, actually send the MiGs to Ukraine, and that is a NATO country that is now engaging in war efforts. So all of those, I mean, will have ramifications. It might weaken Russia to the point of, you know, now the the the, the GCC countries will, will okay, we we're, we're not supporters of this, right? We want to wash our hands off this, and we then they can have more uh, playing room here in in trying to navigate with the agreements that they had with Russia and so forth, that would give them a bit more leverage in, in working that out with the United States. But I think the, the GCC countries and, and MENA countries are really hedging here. Is 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 they're watching this like hawks and and because that will affect their relationship with the United States, with, with the European countries. And um yeah they're they're watching this. They're it's really a close watched development that will have effect on, on the MENA region at large. Not just the wheat, but also the relationship that they have and how they're going to relate to Russia and China as an alternative. Mm. Absolutely amazing, Gaither. I uh, really appreciate you giving me some of your time again. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to get to talk to you. I get the sense as well. Uh, I think I felt the same last time I spoke with you, but the there's so much going on in, in the MENA region. Uh, <laughs> it seems like every country has its own big problem that somehow adds complexity to the guy next to him and then that double downs again to the guy next to him and so forth yeah. and you end up with this belt of countries that you know i mean most of the world's energy comes from there right maybe that's where it all that's why all the complexity is there but anyway um just amazing thank you there, you're welcome uh, also going back to the geography aspect of it it's it's at the fault line between east and west right there's no mm. uh, you know ignoring that region at all yeah. it's it's where they're at Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right.